the reason you're in town is because you are associated with, I'm not quite sure what the connection is officially, but you're associated with this great new documentary called Page One Inside the New York Times, and you are one of the featured characters, I guess. We've come up with the word subjects. Subjects. The word stars sounds funny for a documentary about journalists. Gotcha. So subjects. Okay. <laughs> so the first thing I want to do is, I think it's fascinating. You, you work at what's called, is it the Media Desk at the New York Times? That's right. Which means that um, on your beat... You are covering your employer in among other uh, among other things. Is that correct? That's right. It's one of the sometimes once in a while awkward parts of the job. Uh, there's about a dozen of us on the media desk, and you know we're covering the trends in the media world. And it's true, once in a while they rub up against the New York Times. Yeah. Uh, I've had to email and call my boss, the editor in chief of the of the Times, for a comment a couple times. And uh, you know, you'd think it would be awkward, but we both handle it pretty professionally. I yeah. think he knows. It's part of the job, yeah. and uh, even if it's not always flattering, it's going to be true. So how long has there been a media desk at the Times? About three years ago, we created this separate media desk. It, we pulled it out from underneath the business desk where you know there's about 100 reporters and editors. And we're a more specialized desk that can deliver stories to all the different parts of the paper. If yeah. you think about it, a lot of stories are media stories. Um, yeah. we, even even the, we had a story out of Joplin, Missouri this week about the Weather Channel being on the ground almost at the same exact time the tornadoes hit there. Yeah. So when you're trying to feed stories to all sorts of the parts of the paper. So what I find fascinating since the New York Times is is still I think the gold standard of journalism in a lot of ways why why is what you're covering newsworthy and why wasn't it considered as newsworthy three years ago and five years ago and ten years ago and fifty years ago I, I think there's a there's a couple reasons for that we've always gotten a lot of space in the paper they've always given us a lot of love for media stories whether it's uh, American Idol you know, the finale was this week, or yep. something more substantive, like in the film, David Carr covers the bankruptcy of the Tribune Company, yeah. uh, and they give a lot of space for that. But they, one of the reasons they pulled the media reporters out into a separate unit was because they saw the media world really being roiled and revolutionized uh, by the changes in the advertising world and by the internet. Yeah. There are so many stories now about how the media is changing, and we think about how we consume media, that's changing as well. Uh, so. I think they wanted to really highlight those stories a few years ago, and it's worked out pretty well for the dozen or so of us that are on the desk. Now, is there a danger that it becomes too solipsistic, that we're too you're too into navel gazing, and that the, only the the people that are really interested in the media are the media? Right, we have themselves. to cover it the right way. That's definitely true. You know, you have to approach it thinking about the customers and the consumers of media first. Yeah. The stories really need to be about how we engage with the world, how we learn information, because yeah. uh, the media is really our uh, they, they are our translators for what's going on in the world, whether it's politics or foreign affairs. And we need a healthy, vibrant media to show us what show us what is around our world. Yeah. You have to make sure you approach it from that point of view and not from the point of view of what your friends and your colleagues and your competitors are doing down the block. So how do you determine that something like American Idol, the finale last night, which I also covered here this morning, <laughs> how do you determine that that is newsworthy? Because it's popular? You know, for American Idol, it's the biggest television show in the country, so you have to address it, Okay. Uh, you know, at, least in, at least in my point of view. Yeah. It's also a great way to create new stars, although recent years we haven't seen people become as popular through it. It's still a way to create new singing talent, so yeah. I think you approach it through that way. Um, you know, I was also covering Oprah Winfrey's finale this week. <laughs> Moi aussi, yeah, exactly. Talk about popular shows. Uh, yeah. you know, we're never going to have another Oprah again. And uh, when you cover a story like that, I think you also think about how, how the country's changing. People are fragmenting. They're watching. Uh, there's, there's more shows to watch, and fewer people are watching every individual show. So when yeah. someone like Oprah steps down, you can step back and look at what it means, I think, for the country. And, well, for publishers who want to sell books and for advertisers who want to sell products, uh, you can approach it, I think, more holistically that way. And so, so what is the, so what is the, that's really interesting. How you determine what makes the story? Is it about Oprah's biography? Is it about her audience? Is it about the ratings or the impact on business? Yeah. How do you determine? Yeah. There are so many avenues to cover a media sensation like that. How do you determine what? Is New York Times worthy or Brian Stelter worthy? Well, I wanted to go to Chicago, so I made it about the fans. I thought the most interesting story was about the fans who stood in line, who got into that final taping. You know, yeah. my mom grew up watching Oprah. I think I was sort of raised by Oprah <laughs> through my mom. Uh -huh. And so I wanted to write about people like my mom who have watched for decades and who have been inspired by her. That was my angle for the finale. But the other angle is, is corporate. You know, they were trying to charge a million dollars for a commercial on that last episode. Yeah. That's crazy. I'm not <laughs> yeah. sure anybody actually paid that much. But it speaks to the power of that brand that she has, and I thought that was a good business angle. 
Now, uh, let's because you're working on a newspaper and the focus of this particular documentary, which I assume you had nothing to do with, you just they the filmmakers came to you. This isn't a, a product of New York Times saying, "Hey, I know, let's make a documentary about no, ourselves." No, we're not that smart. Yeah, okay. <laughs> you used to be. Now, here, here's the here's my question. Uh, and again, we don't I cuz this could take all day too. What do you think the fate, the state and the fate of newspapers is right now? The state of newspapers. Well, it's it's stronger than it was a couple of years ago. It when is. When this film was being okay. produced, when this film was being shot. When the director came in, we were in the depths of the recession. We were laying off people. We were cutting sections of the paper. Uh, we've certainly rebounded from that. Uh, the fate of newspapers, I, I think really depends more on the fate of the internet and of people's willingness to pay for content. Yeah. Uh, will print newspapers suddenly have a surge in popularity? I doubt it, personally, as a customer who prefers it online. But does journalism have a future, a vibrant future online? I sure think it does. Yeah. Uh, I think that people, they want real information. They want quality information. And there are some signs out there that they're tired of getting fed stuff that isn't as high quality. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that there will remain a core audience for an uh, outlet like the New York Times that tries to get the facts right. We don't always, but we try. Yeah. Now, uh, oh, there's so many ways we can go. Let's let's go with your personal biography. Actually, is fascinating vis-a-vis -vis the Times because you started out. You are you are a creature, if not a creation, of the internet. Why don't That's you right. t give us a little bit about your background and how I you do ended feel up? Feel a little funny evangelizing for the Times from this point of view. <laughs> yes. I, I, I grew up on the internet and had a computer when I was five years old. I was so lucky to be born in that little span of human history where anybody can create a web page, create a newspaper, create journalism. So yeah. in college, I created a blog called TV Newser, which was all about television news. I, I don't know what I was thinking, but I wanted to be a television news anchor. <laughs> uh, I thought that was crazy, and, and I guess I realized I was already starting to lose my hair on the top of my head. I probably wasn't <laughs> going to become the next Brian Williams or the next uh, Tom Brokaw, but I could write about it. And it was a perfect college job. Uh, yeah. you know, it paid the bills a little bit. It paid for beer money, at least. So let's stop right there. How did it pay? Uh, well, I was able to sell the blog for a tiny amount of money uh, to a company in New York that wanted to put ads on it. So wow. it's just that typical advertising model. It barely broke even for a few years, but you know they gave me a college job out of it. And because this, the timing is so crucial, what year are we talking about? I started years? the blog in '04 when blogging was, we were just starting to yeah. hear about it. And I graduated in 2007. Now at that point, even places like the New York Times were looking around for talent online and looking for ways to incorporate the web into their institutions. You know, you think about a place like the New York Times, it's never been, uh, it's, it's not as old fashioned as it sounds, but it was a place that needed more uh, engagement with the web and needed more people from the web. And so in that year, 2007, when I joined, there were also a bunch of other web hires that were designed to really bulk up the website. Is that right? Uh, so you were hired, now your stuff shows up in print, yeah, I've, I've sort of swam in the wrong direction. I've been going upstream. I've, I've gone from the web to print. I actually, I, there's something about, I guess when you walk in the building, they, they, they infuse you with the Times DNA. Yeah. I love having that paper at the end of the day because it gives you a deadline to get everything right and to get it uh, as clear ah. as you possibly can. Now, online, you can always be making changes. It doesn't mean we screw it up on the first edition, but yeah. online, there's no final deadline. There's something really exciting about that final deadline at the end of the day, knowing that, you know, that's the last chance you have to make any tweaks. Now, when you were hired, because, I mean, it's, New York Times is considered the old gray lady. Were you, when you were hired, were you like, you know, by the veterans, were, did they look askance <laughs> at you, these young pups who think they know it all? They might have a little bit. Uh, <laughs> there was less ageism than I expected, but there was probably a little bit. I had to prove myself, and yeah. so I put my nose down and worked really hard. Now, are you proving yourself differently because you're with traditional media as opposed to hmm. completely online? I think so, because I think I realized that to get huh. promoted, I had to write for the print edition. Is that you know, right? That might, that's actually a little bit old-fashioned, if you yeah. think about it, because we have more readers online than we do in paper. But especially back in 07 and 08, in order to really stand out, you had to be on the front page of the paper. And I think yeah. that's changing. I think if you're on the home page now, that's just as valuable. Yeah. But back then, being on the front page was the most important thing. And so I, I, you know, I, I did that for a while. I learned how to write for the paper, which was important. And I noticed at the same time, lots of other 20-somethings were being hired, too. Yeah. The Times has gotten younger. Uh, they're huh. reaching out to new audiences, and they know they need younger writers to do that. Okay, now you just mentioned something that I think sounds fascinating. What is the difference between writing writing for newsprint, in effect, yeah. a newspaper, and writing online? There's or is some there one? tonal differences. You know, I write a little more casually online. 
I write in the present tense sometimes and talking about things that are happening today. That's very broadcast journalism. Like, it is. Like, it is a yeah. bit more like broadcast. You feel like yeah. you're live in a way that you're, you're not in the paper. Yeah. When something happens, uh, you know, you take, actually, let's go back 18 months when Oprah decided to quit her show. And she, this came out at like 6 o'clock on a Thursday night. And it drove me crazy because we were two hours from the print deadline. But those first blog posts were very live. I was adding one paragraph at a time, just hitting refresh, you know, to add more information. By the time you get into the print edition, it sounds like it all happened yesterday. It's very much a voice of God for the print edition. Yes. Uh, but those dynamics are fun to play with. It's fun to be able to, to, to do it from both angles. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because we work at a radio station, and way back when, we never had a visual presence, for instance, and now all of our, all of our reporters have cameras. We have That's videotapes right. when we do these interviews. I mean, it's a, everyone is becoming, you know, sort of a, a one-man band yeah. in effect. So and that, I think it's better for the c customers. It's a little annoying for us sometimes. I know I don't always like having to shoot video at the same time I'm trying to do an interview for the paper. Yeah. But, you know, I know my brothers, who are a little younger than me, would much rather watch a video or yeah. much rather hear audio. They'd rather hear me call into the radio station and talk about something than to read my story. And, hey, if that's how they want it, I'll give it to them that yeah. way. Yeah. So um, what I'd like to do is, uh, there again, so many topics. You, um, in the movie, and, again, I know there are other topics we can talk about, but in the movie, you become a passionate, I don't know if it's a defender or an explainer of why Twitter is so important. <laughs> so let's, let's uh, uh, talk to me about the value of Twitter. The upside, and maybe then the downside. But let's yeah. talk about the upside. Well, of the, the upside for me is about talking to the audience. You know, here at a radio station, you guys have call-in numbers. You're getting calls all the time. In newspapers feel more like fortresses. At least they have huh. in the past. And especially for some of the New York Times. You don't even know where to start. You don't even know where to call, how to get in. I think social networking websites, especially Twitter, allow people a way over the walls of the fortress. And they show that we're actually not as hard to reach as we might appear. Uh, that's true for Facebook, too. Being able to contact me on Facebook has been really valuable because people don't want to go try to find my New York Times address. And yeah. if they write to me, they don't think I'm going to ever reply. But on Facebook, it's much more personal, much more accessible. But don't you get, because, I mean, the thing is, like, with emails, I get thousands of emails. Don't you get too much contact, too many tweets, I, I too do, many Facebook I do, but I try Facebook to reply content. to as many as I possibly can. And I, I try you to... Do. Show people. So, what part of that is your job? That's that's interesting to me. That's something we don't quite know yet. Yeah. You know, I, I, thankfully, my editors understand and respect um, social media. Uh, they they aren't all using it themselves, but they know why I should be doing it, and, yeah. I, and I'm really thankful for that. I try to reply to as many people as I can because I have this crazy outlandish theory that maybe if I reply to people, they're going to be one percent more likely to pay for the paper. <laughs> I can't prove right? it. It's I that personal contact. I can't prove it, but maybe you know, maybe someday they'll sign up. Okay. And so um, I don't know if you're comfortable. Uh, explicating the downside, but let me try. So here's the problem with uh, with Twitter is that you get any any old fool also yeah. can tweet, yeah. and then to you know to separate the wheat from the chaff and all of that. I mean, how how much you of a downside? You get stuck in an echo chamber. The danger of all these uh, these sites yes. is that they're self selecting samples. So you can't go quoting people just from Twitter. You can't let that be your contact or your Rolodex. Yeah. You have to be more diverse than that. But in some cases, it can be helpful to have your ear to the ground on Twitter, even if you know it's a self-selecting sample. Because yeah. even, even from that group, you're getting good feedback about your stories. And oh, every day, in subtle ways, they improve my stories by making me think about things I hadn't thought of before or giving me people to call that I hadn't thought of either. Okay, so can you give me an example? In, in a single day, how many tweets do you think you receive, and then how many tweets do you send out? Uh, I try to send about one an hour. Uh, if there's breaking huh. news, I'll do it more often. I was at the Oprah finale. I was standing on the street talking to people. I probably posted 10 things that I heard in yeah. that hour. You know, don't want to overwhelm people, but I wanted to give them a sense of what it was like. Gotcha. Uh, and then uh, probably 100 to 200 replies, depending on the day, uh, from people. I, I, I do read it all. I try to reply to everybody. It gets a little hard sometimes. But I think we have an obligation to do that because people don't trust the media. You know, the, the studies show time and time again, most people distrust the media. Now, I think they probably trust their local station, their local newspaper. But by and large, they don't trust the media. And I think we need to win them back by being more accessible, by being more transparent.